Rector Torfs, Vice Rector, distinguished jurists from the European Court, from the Hague Tribunal, from other courts, Dean Tillman, faculty, students, families, parents, and loved ones. It is with great pleasure that I return to KU Leuven to be with you and to have you join me as an alumna of this wonderful and distinguished institution. Students, you are graduating from one of the oldest and most distinguished law faculties in the world. And it has been my great joy in the last few years to come to know your faculty and your studies very well. Students, you should also appreciate the great support and love that you have received from your families. So I think we should take a moment and applaud the families that have supported our students. It is a special honor for me to be with you today because I have learned recently that one of the most distinguished presidents of my university, Georgetown, in Washington, Patrick Healy, in the 19th century, got his doctorate from KU Leuven. And he is a very distinguished person because we have learned that he was one quarter African American and a slave, and was the first African American to become a Jesuit priest, and the first African American to become the president of a very distinguished university. So KU Leuven and my University of Georgetown in Washington have a over lifetime relationship. Also among your graduates is Alexander Verbecki, a young friend of mine who is graduating today with his master's in law, and I congratulate him, and it makes it especially meaningful for me to be here with him and his family and all the rest of you. Commencement speeches in the United States always start with a few jokes, but I have to tell you there is nothing funny about the United States of America right now. <laughs> Very strange but not funny. My husband and I actually grew up in the neighborhood of Donald Trump. And when we have the reception, we'd be happy to tell you some not so funny jokes about our president. Uh, so instead, I propose today to be somewhat serious with you, paying some attention to the Belgian roots of my inspiration for this talk this morning. My talk is about when the rule of law is more than law, or when the rule of law is not enough. So as you begin to use your law degrees and to think about the rule of law, I hope by the end of my talk you will learn to use the law humanely in the service of justice and peace and what is good for human beings. But the rule of law has a slightly more complicated history than that. All of you students have studied some version of Roman law. I know KU Leuven is one of the schools that still requires Roman law. As someone who studied in the common law system, I only came to study Roman law myself within the last five years, working in a study group in California with some classicists, historians, and law professors to study Roman law. And to recognize as a comparative law person that human beings, whether in Rome centuries ago, or in Europe or the United States now, despite the differences in their legal systems, have come to some very similar solutions to certain problems. And the great philosophers have given us some definitions of the rule of law. We know that all rules of law try to provide rules for liability, responsibility, care for the injured, care for family, for children, and even for slaves in Rome. My text and my inspiration today comes from a book written by a woman born of a Belgian mother, Marguerite Yusinar, and the Memoirs of Hadrian. Uh, I will speak a little bit about what Hadrian said, but actually the work is a work of fiction, and the words that she attributes to Hadrian are actually the words of Marguerite Yusinar, the first woman inducted into the Académie Française for her fiction and for this incredible work that she wrote over several decades. In this remarkable book, which is a fiction, written in the style of a letter from the great Emperor Hadrian to his ultimate successor, Marcus Aurelius, it turns out Hadrian said, he was no lover of law. In his words, remember, Eusinas, really, he has little faith in the law. Laws are often broken 
and with good reason, when they are too complicated, too severe, part of the very savagery that they were meant to correct, are the product of force, or most importantly, when they are too rigorous for the spirit of the times. And then those laws should be modified or repealed to reflect what the society can actually adhere to. Hadean seems to have been an interdisciplinary law and society scholar himself, or a practical man. He acknowledged, through Yusina's words, the important work that law did to create the hygiene of the cities of Rome, a transportation system of water throughout the Roman Empire, inheritance law, and many important legacies in our current legal systems. However, he also recognized the important lesson of my talk this morning, that law alone was not enough. Formal legality is not the only way to reach peace or to develop a culturally rich society. Hadrian promised, as one of the good emperors of Rome, to enact more humane laws for the treatment of women and slaves, who he acknowledged, through Eusinar's words, did most of the work in the management of home life and other important work in Rome, as well as his beloved Athens. As you go off, students, into the next stage of your life, using your legal studies, I want to reflect with you just for a few moments on what is meant by the rule of law and what is not meant by it, and how the rule of law is a necessary but not sufficient condition for just societies, and how your role now as a group of legally educated citizens is so important in our efforts to reach some sense of global justice and sense in this world. The rule of law comes to us from ancient philosophers often quoting the maxim that we should have a rule of law, not men, meaning that no one should be above the law. And leaders and governments should be subject to the same law and enforcement of that law as any citizen of the society. The law is therefore two-sided, Janus-faced. It provides for prohibitions, those things we cannot do, and also permissions, those things which we as citizens and which the government is authorized to do. Rule of law philosophers tell us that the basic characteristics of law are that law should be general, it should be clear, it should be knowable to the citizens, it should be transparent and prospective. You should not be punished for something if the law was not the law when you did it, but only if it was the law at the present time. The law should be predictable, certain, consistent, stable, reasoned, fair, equitable, and impartial. You may have noticed that these characteristics identified by the philosophers of law are mostly procedural or processual, not substantive criteria. The idea is that the rule of law should be objective and neutral and a set of criteria that would be compatible with many forms of government, including those that are not necessarily democratic. The rule of law says nothing about how we should organize our society politically, socially, or economically. But anyone who, like myself, you just heard, I am the child of Holocaust survivors and refugees, anyone who has been subjected to the rules of Nuremberg the rules of apartheid in South Africa, or the American rule of law of slavery should know those things were neither impartial, fair, nor reasonable, and yet they were law. They were positively enacted laws by fully constituted legislatures at the time. We now call that sort of regime not rule of law, but rule by law when regimes use law unjustly and rigorously and unfairly, and the law-infused regime uses law only and not other values to conduct its affairs. Some might say that parts of China um, or Singapore, or I don't agree with that, I've lived in Singapore, or other fundamentalist regimes in the world are now those regimes ruled by law rather than rule of positive law. 
So more modern legal philosophers in my common law world, HLA Hart in England and Lon Fuller in the United States, had a very interesting debate in the 1950s and 60s about whether law must be just and fair to be law and not only positively enacted. So the rules of law, which you have all studied, students, are extremely important, but they are not enough. You have learned the technical aspects of law. You have studied rules and principles of property law and inheritance law and contract law and, and personal matters and the relationships of citizens to each other and citizens to the state. But I want you to, to leave you this morning to think about two other very important aspects of the rule of law. We say that the rule of law says that no man should be above the law. Well, rules and law are made by men, and now a few women. And therefore, we must never forget that the rule of law does not exist alone. It exists in the human beings that make it, apply it, interpret it, and enforce it. And those people are people. So when rules are used, they do not act alone. The rules are enacted by people. And when those people are Adolf Hitler, or the Roman Emperor Nero, or Chairman Mao, or maybe even the latest interesting couple, Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump, we know that the rule of law does not often control the leader, and the law itself may be enacted by someone who is quite lawless. As some of you may know, our president has tweeted recently using social media that he does not trust our courts, and he will not necessarily abide by decisions by our courts of appeal, and maybe not even the Supreme Court, when there are rulings on his very famous travel bans for immigration to the United States. So law alone is not enough. What is needed with the rule of law are the institutions that are committed not only to process, but to substantive commitments of fairness and justice. Elected legislatures, independent courts, and most importantly, and that is you students and family, an educated and committed civil society and a culture of humanistic, fair, caring, ethical, and respectful values that you will give each other in recognizing your human dignity and in your own social and legal life. The rule of law must be culturally internalized in every human being, whether in a truly Montesquieuian, Lockean, Rousseauian sense of checks and balances of the government, separations of power, consent of the governed, or most importantly, our internal communal commitments so that citizens and human beings can assert that the rule of law should be taken seriously and legitimately exercised when it is not, such as in our current troubled times. When it is not, as Hadrian reminds us, it needs to be responsive to the people, revised, and reconsidered. It also asks us to consider the role of our leaders when they do not act fairly or justly. As I am wont to do these days in my own troubled land, I remind my own students of a great and little known statement by Thomas Jefferson, one of the important people involved in the American Revolution, not present at the Constitutional Convention that we had in 1787, Thomas Jefferson suggested that even our veritable Constitution, now copied all over the world in one form or another, should be revisited in every generation. Using property principles of, the, of those days, he said 19 years. Every 19 years, we should re-examine our law. You in Europe are doing a far better job of that than we are in the United States. After the horrible war wars of World War I and World War II, you now face the challenges of migration, debt in the European Union, membership, and Brexit. And nevertheless, you still work hard to achieve a more perfect union, that is American phrase, recognizing the importance of seeking, as did Roman law, the sorts of rules that are great enough to operate within a large region, 
un giving unity to all citizens, but also a margin of appreciation for when some cultural differences should be recognized and treated respectfully. That form of diversity in law and a certain form of federalism, in my view, in the European Union at the moment, troubled though it may seem, is far better than the American experiment across the pond. We in the United States put too much attention, in my view, on individual liberty and our arguments that people should have a freedom from law rather than a belief in the rule of law serving all the citizens for the collective good and for more social welfare caring values. So it is important that the rule of law reside not only in the judges and the lawyers, but also in the civil society. As you have seen recently in the elections in France, in the Netherlands, and in Austria, the citizens have pushed back against a potentially autocratic and non-rule of law regime. Exercising an understanding that the modern rule of law also includes human rights for all. And when those human rights are challenged, the civic voters shall speak and should speak. So I encourage those of you with your new legal training and your families to exercise your citizenship with respect and dignity for all. Secondly, not only is the rule of law made by people, therefore the human side of it, but most importantly for me, for those of you who may have been present last year during my honorary doctorate lecture, sometimes the rule of law is not enough at all because it is too rigid. The rules of law are made for the general public, for the average situation by a legislature, deciding what is the best rule to be followed. And courts decide disputes based on the past of disputants that are before them. In the modern world, we have come to understand that sometimes using mediation or negotiation or some other forms of human interaction, the parties may actually come up with a better solution to their problem than the precedents of the past or the codified rules in the civil law system. So I hope that your studies have included not only the technical rules of law, but also the important fields of human communication how to truly listen and hear and to have empathy for the other side and also to exercise a little creativity in deciding what is the right solution for a problem, not only referring to the rules of the past. For those of you who have not heard me before, our two famous examples in our field are two sisters fighting over an orange and the mother comes and does what a rule of law might do, cut the orange in half and tell the sisters to share their orange. But someone who might say to the sisters, why do you want your orange, might learn that one wanted the peel, the outside, to cook with, and the other wanted the juice of the orange to drink. For me, my very real personal example, appropriate in Belgium, has to do with chocolate. And that is, as a young girl, when my young brother and I fought over the one piece of remaining chocolate cake, my mother did what mothers do and decision makers do, and some arbitrators do, are accused of splitting the baby, cutting the cake. But when my brother and I were old enough to speak to each other, I said, what do you like about the cake? And he said, the cake. And I said, wonderful, I love the icing. So by cutting the cake this way, each of us had 100% of what we wanted, no need to divide the cake, and the important lesson is always to ask, what does someone want of a situation? And can we figure out some way to either divide the orange or the cake, or bake another cake, or buy another fruit, so that we can expand the pie and not assume scarcity of resources? These are the modern challenges of our modern life. When are things scarce resources, and when by using creativity, can we expand what is available to all of us? I'm going to conclude in a few moments by returning to Hadrian, who advised Marcus Aurelius that Rome was very lucky to have been placed between the past and the great ideas of Greece 
and with the vast and unknowable future. Hadrian, once again, in Eusenar's words, said that Rome was more practical. Rome created laws, but most importantly, Rome created roads, those roads that we all take now to visit each other and to move from one culture to another, learning from every place that we possibly can. He urged the revision of his own laws, better treatment of slaves, women, and non-citizens in some cases than the Greeks had, but he also was a wise man, at least in the footnotes of Eusenar's text, that he recognized that the history of humankind would have ups and downs of progress and regression. I fear we are in a sad moment of regression at the moment, and I look to you, the graduates of this wonderful program at Levin, you are the future. Please turn this moment of temporary regression, of hate, of social media and false facts into a positive place, a place of meeting communication across the world, and to do as the rule of law is commonly called on to do now, pro bono publico, work in the public good, recognizing that the rule of law is something that we should all participate in making. We have increased enfranchisement and who can vote throughout the world. Now let us use those votes to create justice and not just the rule of law. So I mentioned one other great scholar, the Frenchman de Tocqueville, who came to the United States in the 19th century and made a very important observation. He saw in 19th century America that it was the lawyers who were the mediators of the culture. The lawyers stood between the rulers, the leaders, though democratically elected, and the rest of society. So those of you who are about to use your law degrees, whether as practicing lawyers, or in business, or in education, or in government, use what you know about the rule of law to mediate and use the law humanely with concern for how the rule of law affects people actually, not just the law on the books. I want to say the rule of law is necessary. We must have rules that cabin our leaders and give them rules for how to behave, but it's not enough. I don't know if any of you are with me on Friday night for the wonderful Beatles concert in the Old Market, but many Beatles songs were sung and I was reminded of my time watching the Beatles live in 1966 when they sang All the World Needs, World Needs Love. And it's so it is very important to use the rule of law wisely to be sure our leaders behave properly, but it is just as important to treat each other with love and fellow feeling and empathy and respect. I close by suggesting quickly that we have three challenges in the rule of law. One is the increased complexity of our world with social media and transnational and cross-border transactions and dealings. How does the rule of law operate across sovereign entities that make the rule of law? Secondly, as the Romans tried to understand, to what extent can we have a rule of law that is uniform around not just a country, but a region? And thirdly, what is the challenge for the rule of law internationally? Can we have the same rules of law uh, that will govern all of us without a very active international legislature, without an international army? How can we enforce that law? And the answer is by internalizing the good values of justice and fairness and caring and human dignity and respect for all. I close, um, as all commencement speeches do, with some quotations and a poem or a thought for you to contemplate as you go forth into the world and use your degrees. The great American poet Ma Maya Angelou said, people will not always remember what we say. I know in a few moments my speech will disappear uh, into the sky, except we might possibly publish it. Um, and people will sometimes remember what we do. But most importantly, people remember how you make them feel. So treat each other as you use your law degrees with respect, dignity, love, and remember that law is enacted and enforced by people. Be the best law person you possibly can. 
Congratulations, and thank you very much.